Thank you. Let's set a comfortable meditation posture and close the eyes. Put our attention on that silence that's always there deep in the mind. Connect with that silence. Become the silence. You are the silent witness. Now from this perspective of the silent witness, please listen to the words of the Yoga Vashishta. Chapter 10, continuing with verse 19. The rays of light radiating from his body gave it an appearance of a hill filled with heaps of crimson kinsuka flowers growing in mountain forests. Rays of living fire flashing from his trident gave it the glare of golden ringlets fastened to the ears of all sides of the scalp. The breath of his host hurled down mountain ridges, hanging about them like swinging cradles. His dark sword flashed with somber light. and darkened the disk of the sun, as if by the smoke of the final conflagration of the earth. Having appeared before the great sage who was engaged as the raging sea, he soothed him to calm them, as after a storm by the gentle the speech. This is just speaking. The sages are acquainted with the laws of nature and know the past and future as present before them. They are never moved with a motive for anything, and they are far removed from being moved without a cause. You sages observe the many rules of religious austerity. We observe the endless and immutable laws of destiny. We honor you for your holiness and not from any other desire. Do not defame your righteousness by your rage, nor think to do us any harm. We are spared unhurt by the flames of final dissolution, and we cannot be consumed by your curse. We have destroyed the spheres of the universe and devoured legions of Shivas and millions of Brahmas and multitudes of Vishnu. Therefore, what is there that we cannot do? We are appointed as devourers of all beings. And you are destined to be devoured by him. This is ordained by destiny itself and not by any act or of our own will. It is the nature of flame to ascend upwards and that of fluids to flow downward. It is destined for food to be eaten 
by its eaters. And that creation must be destroyed by it. We know this form of mind to be that of the Supreme Being, whose universal spirit acts in various forms all over the universe. To the unstained sight, there is no other agent or object here except the Supreme. Although the stained sight sees many agents and objects, agency and objectivity are terms coined only by the short sight. They disappear before the expanded view of the wise. As flowers grow on trees, so are animals born on earth. Their growth and birth, and also their fall and death, are of their own spontaneity and mistakenly caused, called their causation. As the motion of the moon caused by no usual causal cause, though the unwise falsely attribute a causality to it, which such also is the course of death in the world, its own spontaneous nature. The mind is falsely said to be the agent of all its enjoyments in life. Though it is no agent of itself, it is a mistaken belief, like the false conception of a serpent in the rope, where there is no serpent at all. Therefore, O sage, do not align, allow yourself to be so angry for your sorrow, but consider the course of events that befall humankind in its true light. We are not moved to any act by desire or fa of fame or influenced by pride or passion. We ourselves are subject to destiny, which predominates over all our actions. Knowing that the course of our conduct is subject to destiny appointed by divine will, the wise never allow themselves to be subjected to darkness of pride or passion at our doing. That we must do only our duties at this time is the rule laid down by the wise creator. You cannot attempt to remove it by subject subjecting yourself to ignorance and idleness. Where is that enlightened sight, that gravity and that patience of you, that you grovel in this manner, in the dark, like the blind, and slide from the broad and beaten path laid open for everybody? Why don't you consider your case? as the sequence of your own acts. Why do you, who are a wise man, falsely accuse me like the ignorant? You know that all living beings have two bodies here, of which one is known as the intellectual or the spiritual body or mind. The other is the inert or physical frame that is fragile and perishable. 
the minute thing of the mind lasts until its liberation and is what leads all to their good or evil desire. As a skillful charioteer guides his chariot with ease, so this body is conducted by the intelligent mind with equal attention and fondness. But an ignorant mind that is prone to evil destroys a good body just like children break their dolls of clay and sport. The mind is called the ruler of the body, Purusha. And the working of the mind is taken for the act of the man. It is bound to the earth by its desires and freed by its freedom from earthly attractions and expectations. The mind is that which thinks in itself. This is my body here, and these are the members of my body, and this is my head. The mind is called life because it has the living principle in it. The mind is one and the same and identical with understanding. It becomes the individual ego by its consciousness. And so the same mind passes under various designations according to its different functions. It is called heart because of the body's effects. And it takes many other names at will. But all earthly bodies are perishing. When the mind receives the light of truth, it is called enlightened intellect, which being free from its thoughts relating to the body, is set to its supreme joy. Thus, as you said, absorbed in meditation, The mind of your son wandered from your present to regions far and wide in the ways of its various desires. He, having left this body behind in the mountain cave of Mandar, he fled to the celestial region like a bird flies from his nest to the open air. This mind got into the city of the guardian gods and remained in a part of Nandana garden in the happy groves of Mandara under a dwelling of Parijata flowers. There he thought he passed a revolution of eight cycles of the four yugas in company with Vishwachi, a beautiful Apsara maiden. He clung to her like a six-footed bee clings to a blooming lotus. But as his strong desire led him to the happy regions of his imagination, so he had his fall from there at the end of what he had earned, like nightly dew falling from heaven. He faded away in his body and all his limbs like a flower attached to an ear or head ornament. He fell down together with his beloved one like ripened fruit from trees. 
being deprived of his aerial and celestial body, he passed through the atmospheric air and was born again in a human figure. This reading by Vashista points out a very important aspect to the development of moksha, whereby one achieves final liberation. And one's existence ends as one becomes only pure consciousness. Let's take the case of someone who has achieved the moksha level one on earth. Having achieved moksha level one, they are living in the now, in the current, present moment, 24 hours a day. They are acting in perfect synchronicity with the universe. They are witnessing all from the silent witness 24 hours a day. However, they have not balanced. All of their karma. They have only bored a tunnel through the mountain ranges of karma. And they live in that tunnel. aware of their karma from all sides. Aware also that at any point, some of their karma might capture their attention again. And if it does, and they begin to act on that karma, become embedded in that false illusion of the world of harmony, they will fall from their state of motion. They will lose their connection with the silent witness and once again find themselves embedded in the illusion. They still have a memory of their enlightenment. but they may not know how to get back there. Some people achieve moksha level one spontaneously, as it were, not knowing what they did to achieve it, and then they lose it just as spontaneously. Living their life in the memory of their Enlightenment. Oh, I was enlightened there. And I lived in the present moment. And life was beautiful. As I witnessed it from a higher state of consciousness. And that lasted for six months or a year. And then one day I realized. I'm worried about something. I'm concerned about something. I'm planning something. The mind has taken over. I realize last night I have no memory. I lost my awareness in deep sleep. My enlightenment is gone. Fortunately for us, we know how to get back there. We must connect with the silent wit, become the silent wit. 
But when we reach this state of moksha, and inevitably, almost inevitably, we lose our connection, we can get back there. But then this person who has achieved final moksha level one drops the body and finds himself or herself in the celestial regions, which are far more beautiful than physical earth. far more enchanting. And it is far more dangerous because the karma still exists. They're an ascended master and they have one duty, help others achieve enlightenment. But just like people who live on earth, they lose their way from time to time. This is what the story of Shukra is telling us. If they have not achieved the moksha level five, there's always this danger. They still have karma. And when they lose this attachment to the silent witness, when they lose their ability to be the silent witness because they allowed themselves to become attached to and embedded in the incredibly beautiful celestial realms, then that tenure turns into an accumulation and a fulfillment of spiritual karma. And after a while, they're back, back on earth. Probably they're back on earth in all kinds of life forms. Four million different kinds of life forms struggling to put together sufficient karma to be born in a human life. Most likely they have forgotten their enlightenment and forgotten what they had achieved. And they're starting over. This is why while we're here on earth, particularly in Kali Yuga, which is not all that beautiful compared to the celestial realms, not all that captivating. We must be very vigilant and achieve the highest possible level of moksha, at least moksha level four. At moksha level four, we're not captivated by the beauty of the celestial realms because we know it's only a dream in our own mind. And we have an excellent opportunity to achieve moksha level five from that platform. But from the lower platforms of level one, two, or three, the odds are not with us. This is why we have such an incredible opportunity today. Today, we're going to create a perfect environment that will be a constant reminder and reinforcement of our enlightenment in our communities. And we will be able to perform our sadhana assisting others achieving enlightenment and our focus will not be lost 
and we will balance mountain ranges of karma. And we will keep the body alive for as long as necessary to achieve at least moksha level four. This is our endeavor. This is why we do everything that we do, because we know if we don't reach moksha level four, it's kind of like we have won the lottery and soon we'll spend all that money and we'll be destitute again. Now let us continue from this beautiful platform of the silent witness. As we start the three mana sanyama on the esoteric mahamantra. And balance the karmic traces that have been touched and enlivened by today's reading of the Yoga
de, 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 